Hey everyone, Dr. D here, and in this video, we're actually covering Chapter 8, Photosynthesis. Let's go ahead, I'll go ahead and get started. So, you may know that photosynthesis happens in plants and uh, other green organisms, but what is it? Okay, photosynthesis is a process that converts solar energy, that's the sun's energy, into chemical energy, usually sugars, right? So you're taking sunlight energy and through a series of conversions, remember you can convert energy from one form to another, uh, you're forming chemical energy in the form of sugars, right? And directly or indirectly, photosynthesis nourishes almost the entire living world. What does that mean? Uh, the, the calories you are getting in your diet originated in by photosynthesis is what that means. So um, even if you're a strict uh, meat eater and you eat only beef, let's say you, you just you just love having chicken and be beef and uh, uh, I don't know pork and whatnot. Uh, uh, what did those animals eat? You know uh, they ate usually photosynthesizers for nourishment. So so you could trace your calories back to a photosynthesizer. What that means is. If plants were to go away, so would our source of nourishment, our source of calories, and so we would also perish. Uh, that, so they're very important. And because they can make their own calories, they're called autotrophs. So autotrophs can sustain themselves without eating anything. So a plant, a plant doesn't need to eat another organism to stay alive. It uses the sun's energy uh, it converts that type of energy to chemical energy, those, those calories, those sugars, and those fats, right? Okay. Autotrophs are producers of the biosphere. Uh, they can take CO2 out of the air and convert it, right? They can use the CO2 in the air to make sugars out of it, which is really cool. So that's another way that these, these uh, photosynthesizers help us. They take CO2 out of the air and they actually convert the CO2 to sugar, which is super helpful to us. Um, and of course, you know, plants also produce oxygen. So that's also super important to us. So there's three reasons why uh, photosynthesizers are required for our uh, life here on Earth. And by our, I mean heterotrophs. Heterotrophs are creatures like you and me that cannot sustain themselves. We require uh, uh, those autotrophs for sustenance. We are the consumers of the biosphere, right? We need those. We need those photosynthesizers for oxygen, for sugars and fats they produce, for removing CO2. You know this harmful greenhouse gas from our environment as well. So let me put it this way. Without plants and without other photosynthesizers on this planet, humans could not live on this planet. And if humans ever decided to go to another planet, we couldn't do so without bringing along a friend. And that friend being a photosynthesizer friend and uh, many of them. <clears throat> uh, that's why uh, plants are very, very well suited for the planet Earth. They can produce their own carbon dioxide they can produce their own oxygen uh, they can in fact you can you can uh, I'll get to this but you could stick a plant in a jar and close that jar off and the plant could live inside the jar uh, whereas a human if you put a human in a jar and close that jar off the human would soon breathe all the co2 and, and pass away right from uh, I'm sorry breathe all the oxygen converting it to co2 and then pass away from that so um, I'll, I'll explain why that is in, in a minute. You'll, you'll understand why a plant could live in a jar, but uh, an animal or a human couldn't live in a jar. Okay, so let's explain this. Uh, oh, by the way, let me just show you the types of photosynthetic organisms there are, photosynthesizers there are. Uh, you know, if it's green, it's, it's most likely a photosynthesizer, but not all photosynthesizers are green. So let me show you what I'm talking about. Uh, plants are obviously green, you know, they're leaves. Anywhere that you see green leaves and things, that's because of chlorophyll, a uh, photosynthetic pigment that allows photosynthesis to happen, and that pigment's in the leaves, right, the structures of the mesophyll, which I'll explain in a minute. 
uh, the algae, algae as well as photosynthetic um, protists, right? So all three of these are eukaryotes, plants, algae, protists, and protists can be single cell creatures like euglena, which are photosynthetic, right? So you can even have little single cell creatures. Um, also cyano, cyanobacteria, which is a type of bacteria. That, the, the, that's a huge portion uh, or proportion of the photosynthesizers on the planet. But here's an example of a purple sulfur bacteria is an example of a non-green photosynthesizer. Okay, so, so most, uh, most of the time when you're talking about photosynthesis, you're talking about green creatures, whether it be eukaryotes like these on the left or prokaryotes like these on the right. Um, but you don't necessarily have to be green. Uh, as long as you're doing the process of photosynthesis. So let me explain real quick in a plant where these photosynthesizing cells are. Leaves, right? The leaves of the plant are usually green, right? The leaves of a plant are usually green, and that's because the green color is from this molecule chlorophyll. Okay, the green color is from chlorophyll. It's a pigment. It's a pigment molecule. And chlorophyll is responsible for utilizing that sunlight energy, trapping that sunlight energy and using it to, to power photosynthesis, or at least the light reactions of photosynthesis, which we're going to talk about soon. And where are the chlorophyll molecules? They're inside certain cells that have chloroplasts, right? The cells that have chloroplasts, these cells are found in the mesophyll of the leaf. What's the mesophyll of the leaf? Let me show you. If we're talking about a leaf on a plant, on a tree, then if you cut open, do a cross section of that leaf, you'll see this is the upper dermis of the, of the leaf. This is the lower dermis. Then you've got little holes where gas exchange happens on the bottom side of the leaf. You've got little pores called stomata. This is where CO2 net flows into the leaf and O2 net flows out. This is why they say oxygens breathe in CO2 and breathe out O2, and, per, and we can use that O2 to breathe. But where are the chloroplasts? Look, the cells that, that are in the middle, the cells of the what are called mesophyll of the leaf, those cells contain the chloroplasts. And there's 30, 40, see... There's uh, 30 to 40 chloroplasts typically in each of those mesophyll cells. So look, this is this would be a cell in the mesophyll right here. It would it would have 30 or 40 chloroplasts inside, and it's those chloroplasts which are remember those organelles, membrane-bound organelles. That's where the chlorophyll pigment molecule lives. Okay, so we're going to talk about that, and this is what the chloroplast looks like. Remember, each mesophyll cell has about 30 or 40 of these inside, these organelles called chloroplasts. The chloroplast has an outer membrane, an inner membrane, but then inside of that it's got these stacks of membrane. You see this? It looks like a little stack. Um, I call these, you know, like I affectionately call these pancake stacks. You know, that's obviously not what they're technically called, but I call them pancake stacks because it makes it clear that this is what I'm talking about. Each stack of these pancake looking things, each stack is called a granum. Granum. Uh, here's the word here, granum. The plural for granum is grana. Grana. Okay. And each pancake in the stack, you see how the, the stack has a bunch of pancakes? Each pancake in the stack is called a thylakoid. thylakoid. So again, the whole stack is called a granum. Multiple stacks is called a grana. And each pancake in the stack is called a thylakoid. Okay? You see the fluid outside of the pancake stacks, this fluid? This fluid out right outside the pancake stacks, that fluid's called the stroma. And do you see the fluid inside of the pancake stacks? That's called the thylakoid space. So again, here's a chloroplast. You have the outer membrane. You have the inner membrane right underneath it. And then you have these stacks of membrane called granum. 
and each pancake in the stack, each component of the stack, is called thylakoid. The fluid outside the stacks is called the stroma. The fluid inside of the stacks is called the thylakoid space. Okay, so that's the architecture of the chloroplast. And remember, each mesophyll cell contains 30 or 40. You can see those 30 or 40 chloroplasts here. And those mesophyll cells are in the middle of the leaf. Okay, the middle of the leaf. And that's why the leaf is green. You know why? Because the chlorophyll molecule is inside the chloroplast. Now, you might be wondering, where is the chlorophyll exactly? inside of the chloroplast. So here's the chloroplast. Okay. You see how they drew the pancake stacks, the granum green? They did that for a reason. The chlorophyll molecule, the chlorophyll molecule, the pigment that makes the leaves green, that pigment is found in the pancake stack membrane. So what is that called? That's called the thylakoid membrane. The membrane of the pancake stacks, that membrane is called the thylakoid membrane. And that makes sense, right? This, this membrane right here on the pancake stacks, that's called the thylakoid membrane. You should know that. And that's where the chlorophyll molecules are. That's why the leaf is green, because those chlorophyll molecules are green. Okay. Now, what is the equation for photosynthesis? Uh, let's use this equation. Let's use this equation for photosynthesis. First of all, take a look at this equation. Take a second to look at this equation. What do, what, what do you see? Does this equation look familiar in any way? I'll give you a second to check it out. If you, if you said it looks like cellular respiration but backwards, uh, then you'd be exactly right. Cellular respiration would be oxygen, six oxygen, and a glucose molecule, which gets converted to water, six water, six CO2, and energy in the form of ATP, right? Well... Notice how photosynthesis is the converse reaction. Converse means opposite reaction, right? In this case, you're taking not ATP energy, you're taking sunlight, solar energy. You're taking six CO2. You're taking six water. And you're producing glucose and six oxygen. So it is the converse reaction to... Uh, cellular respiration. So cellular respiration, the arrow is going this way, and the energy you're making is ATP. Photosynthesis, the arrow is going the opposite way, and the energy you're making is, uh, or the energy you're using, I should say, in this case, with photosynthesis, the energy you're using is solar energy. That's the only difference between the two net equations. Okay. So, do you remember earlier when I said that uh, plants can live inside of a jar, but humans cannot live inside of a jar, right? So, if you put a human inside of a jar and close the jar, that wouldn't be a good plan, right? Because the human would soon do what? This, the human, remember, the humans have cellular respiration, and that means the arrow is going toward the left. So, humans would consume oxygen. And then, and sugars to make CO2, right? And water as products. And at some point, you're going to consume all of the oxygen inside of that jar, right? And you're going to convert it to CO2. Or at least you're going to use it to convert the glucose into CO2, right? So that's the problem with, you know, being in a jar. You're using up all the oxygen, you're going to run out of oxygen, and you're going to pass out in the jar. All right. So why don't plants 
pass out in the jar, right? So look what plants can do. They can do photosynthesis, which is an arrow this way, which means they take CO2 and water to produce sugar and oxygen. Now you might ask, okay, that's great. They're producing oxygen, but what about using up CO2? At some point, they're going to use up all their CO2, right? No. You know why? Because plants have a trick up their sleeve. Plants, not only do they have chloroplasts, which do what? You see, chloroplasts do this reaction where they take CO2 and water to make sugar and oxygen. Guess what? Plants also have mitochondria, like you and me. You know how we have mitochondria, which allows us to take oxygen and glucose to make CO2 and water? Um Plants also have mitochondria. So plants have mitochondria, which produces what? Mitochondria produces CO2. And they also have chloroplasts, which produce O2. So imagine if you could do, if you had chloroplasts, and you could do this reaction, making sugar and oxygen. But you also had mitochondria, which could do the opposite and use that sugar and use that oxygen to make more water and CO2. Do you see? If you have an organelle that does this reaction and you have another organelle which uses those products to do the converse reaction, well then you'd never run out of anything to breathe, right? You'd never run out of CO2 because you could make more CO2. You'd never run out of O2 because you could make more O2. The reason a plant doesn't suffocate in a jar is because it has both organelles, it has the chloroplasts, and it has the mitochondria. So it can use the waste products of one as the reactants of the other process. And so you, it's like this infinite loop where you never run out of your own, you know, uh, resources. Humans, on the other hand, because we don't have chloroplasts, we're going to convert all that oxygen and we're going to produce CO2. Uh, I should say, you use up all the oxygen, produce a bunch of CO2. And so once we've used up that oxygen, we're going to pass out, right? So that is why uh, there's this fundamental difference. And that is why if humans ever have to go to live on another planet like Mars, we're going to need to bring plants with us because we're going to need a source of oxygen. We don't, we don't have a source of oxygen on this planet uh, or any other planet without uh, without something that produces oxygen, like one of these autotrophs, one of these creatures, like photosynthesizers that has chloroplast. So that's pretty cool to talk about. So let me take a quick break. Uh, I'm going to go and get a, a fresh coffee. I'll be right back. Uh, and I'll tell you about this super interesting, super important process that makes life uh, possible on this planet of Earth. Uh, photosynthesis when I get back. Break time. Hey everyone, welcome back. Let's get started. So I was just telling you that photosynthesis is the process of converting uh, solar energy, light energy, oops, sorry, light energy, using light energy to convert CO2 and water into sugar, glucose, and oxygen. Okay, so during this process, the CO2 is going to become reduced. Okay, the CO2 is going to become reduced and the water is going to become oxidized. Okay, so how does that work? What it, remember what reduced means? Gaining of electrons. CO2 is going to gain electrons, it, uh, not only electrons, but protons as well. It's going to get H's, right? Do you guys remember, do you remember the, the equation for sugars? Because what are we trying to do? We're trying to take CO2 out of the air, right? That's what uh, the plant breathes in. When the plant breathes in, it breathes in uh, mostly CO2, okay? And... CO2 is in the air as a gas, and what are we trying to do with it? Do you remember? We're trying to make sugar out of CO2. That's the main thing we're trying to accomplish in photosynthesis. 
We are trying to make sugar out of CO2. But CO2 is a gas. And look at, look at what CO2 is made out of. It's made out of a C and two O's, right? What's sugar made out of? Do you guys remember the uh, chemical formula for sugars? Remember, sugars have C, H, and O. The elements C, carbon, H, hydrogen, and O, oxygen. And do you remember the ratio of C's, H's, and O's? Do you guys remember that? There's one carbon for every two hydrogens for every one oxygen. So it's a CH2O ratio, right? Do you, uh, do you remember, for example, glucose? What's glucose? C6H12O6. You have C's, H's, and O's in a 1 to 2 to 1 ratio of C's, H's, and O's. So look, if we want to take C's and O's and make glucose out of it, we have to give it what? It already has the C's and the O's. What do we have to give it? H's. We have to give it H's so it becomes C-H-O. C6H12O6, which is glucose. Where did the H's come from? Where did the H's come from? Magic? No. That's where water comes in. Look, we need water as a reactant. Reactant means starting material. Remember that. We need water because it's the it's the source of our H's, of our electrons, right? And again, please remember when I say electrons, H's are more than just electrons, aren't they? H's are an electron and a proton, but we call them a source of electrons because that's the main thing we care about. But don't forget, it's not just an H. It's an H and a, and a po uh, proton. So anyway, you're taking water, you're taking the H's from the water, and you're handing the H's to the carbon dioxide to make sugar, to make sugar, okay? And what's left over once you've taken all the H's from water, what's left over? Oxygen. This is why the plant net breathes in carbon dioxide because it's going to reduce the carbon dioxide to sugar and it net breathes out oxygen because that's what's left over of the water once you've oxidized the water once you've removed its electrons it those removed those h's and handed those h's to the carbon dioxide to make sugar so again just to review carbon dioxide gets reduced to glucose because you're giving it electrons remember gain of electrons means reduced water is the source of those electrons. So water's losing those electrons. Water's becoming oxidized to oxygen. Okay? So just remember that. So it, it summarized here, look, carbon dioxide is becoming reduced to glucose. See? The difference between CO2 and glucose is it's gained a bunch of H's, right? It's gained a bunch of electrons. It's become glucose, C6H12O6. And Meanwhile, water, water has become oxidized to oxygen. That's where the H's came from. So think about this. You're taking the H's from the water. You're giving them to the CO2. The CO2 becomes sugar. And the water is left out as oxygen. It's now broken down into oxygen. And that process required energy to happen. You can't just make sugar for free. That energy is solar energy. That energy is from the sun, okay? And that's where the chlorophyll molecules come in. Chlorophyll uh, is the molecule that's going to capture that sun energy, solar energy, to, to make this process go. So there are actually two stages. I want to show you this, this figure here um, because there are two stages, two main parts to photosynthesis. The part on the left in this figure and the part on the right in this figure. Okay, there's two parts. The first part to photosynthesis is called the light reactions, and that requires light. That's why it's called the light reactions. Then you're ready for part two, the second part of photosynthesis, which is called the Calvin cycle. This is the part that actually makes the sugar. 
Okay. So the light reactions are the first part. They involve light and those chlorophyll molecules. And the second part is called Calvin cycle. That's where you actually make your sugar, your CH2O multiples, right, which is sugar. All right, let me explain just a bird's eye view, a big overview of how, of, uh, how photosynthesis works. Okay, let me show you how this process works. Look at the left here, the light reactions. What are you doing? Um, and again, I'm, I just want to give you a big overview, and we'll get into details later. Don't, don't get confused. Don't say, oh, well, how exactly does that work? I'm not focusing on how exactly this works right now. I just want to show you the overview so in your mind you can see um, the big picture. Okay, ready for big picture? Okay, look, the light reactions require light. Light is hitting the, what is this? These pancake stacks, you remember? It, so this must be the chloroplast, you see? This whole thing I'm, I'm highlighting right now, this is the chloroplast, which is the photosynthetic organelle inside of the mesophyll cells. Remember there are 30 or 40 of these in each mesophyll cell, you got a chloroplast. Inside of the chloroplast, remember you have these stacks of membrane. I call them pancake stacks. Uh, those are called granum. So this is the granum. And do you remember the membrane of the granum? It's called the thylakoid membrane. Well, the thylakoid membrane is where the chlorophyll molecules are. And the chlorophyll molecules respond to light. Light hits the chlorophyll molecules in the thylakoid membrane. And that's what actually... Uh, captures the energy from the sunlight to make the light reactions go. And what do you do with that energy? Here's what you're going to do. Ready? You take water. Water is a reactant. You take water, okay, you're using the sunlight energy to oxidize the water. Do you remember what that means? Remove the H's from water. Remove the electrons from water. What happens if you remove the H's from water? What's left over? If I remove the H's from wa water, what's left over? Oxygen, you see? And so the product is oxygen. Do you see why oxygen is a product of photosynthesis now? Because the first thing you're going to do is take sunlight energy to remove the H's from water. And all that's left over are O's, which is oxygen. Two of the O's find each other and leave as O2. That leaves as gas, oxygen gas, for us to enjoy, for us to breathe, right? So where did the H go? Where did the H go? Did it just float off? No, the H is handed to an electron carrier called NADP+. This is the oxidized form of the carrier. This is an electron carrier. It does what its name suggests. It carries electrons. So here's what you're doing. You're using sunlight energy to remove the H's from water. You're handing those H's to what? You're giving those H's to NADP+. And that becomes, what is NADP+, what happens once you give it those electrons and a proton? It becomes NADPH. And you don't need to know this, but you hand two electrons and one proton to NADP+, so that it becomes NADPH. Okay, so NADPH is the reduced form of the electron carrier, right? So now look, you can think of it this way. The H's, the H's and the electrons, you could call them the H's, the electrons on NADPH are the electrons that were on the water. So the water is the primary electron donor here. The water is where the electrons are coming from. Sunlight energy allows you to remove those electrons, hand them to the electron carrier. The electron carrier becomes reduced to NADPH. Now you have NADPH. You've, you now have the H's from the water on NADPH, and the oxygens from water are floating off as waste gas. Now here's a thing that happens as well. Look, because of this process of the light reactions in the granum, you're also taking ADP and inorganic phosphate, and you're making ATP. So you're making some ATP as well. 
Now, again, I'm not going to tell you uh, right now exactly how this ATP is made, but uh, for now, just know that during the light reactions, not only are you oxidizing water to oxygen and handing its electrons to the electron carrier NADP plus to form NADPH, you're also forming some ATP, which is nice. And that ATP is formed by a process known as photophosphorylation. Okay, so now uh, let's summarize real quick. Let's summarize the light reactions of photosynthesis. You take light, you use the light energy uh, to oxidize water and the waste product is called oxygen the electrons are handed to the electron carrier NADP plus which is then reduced to NADPH and as a nice little side bonus you form some ATP as well through a process known as photophosphorylation great so the products of for, of the light reactions are ATP and NADPH, and the waste product is oxygen. The reactants were water and sunlight. Okay, those are the that's the main concept, I should say, to the light reactions of photosynthesis, which happen uh, basically in the granum of the chloroplast. Okay, so now you're ready. Have you made sugar yet? We haven't made any sugar yet. That's why we're going to do the Calvin cycle. So the Calvin cycle is where you actually make your sugar. And how do you make sugar? Do you remember I said this earlier? To make sugar, you need C's, H's, and O's, right? That's the recipe for sugar. You need C's, H's, and O's to make sugar. And not only do you need C's, H's, and O's, you need a 1 to 2 to 1 ratio of C's, H's, and O's, a 1 to 2 to 1 ratio of C's, H's, and O's. So where do we get our C's and our O's? See, we take CO2. That's our source of C's and O's for sugar. And plants take that CO2 from the air. And this is why plants are so neat. They reduce the CO2 in the air. Because just like we breathe in oxygen and breathe out CO2, as a waste product, plants breathe in more CO2 and breathe in more oxygen. Okay, so they're they're taking they're like little carbon dioxide sponges, right? They're taking the CO2 out of the air with their stomata. Remember the little breathing pores underneath their leaves. They take the CO2 out of the air. Now, is that a sugar? CO2 is that a sugar? No, you need to give it H's, right? Do we have some H's anywhere that we could give to the CO2 to make sugar? Where do we have H's? Ah, oh, do you remember this? Look, what did we make during the light reactions? N-A-D-P-H. There's, there's a bunch of H's right there, right? Electrons and protons, right? H's, right? Um, where did those H's come from? They came from water originally. You see that? The H's from water were given to NADP plus to make NADPH. Now we have these H's. So guess what the Calvin cycle is all about? Guess what the Calvin cycle is all about? In this cycle, you're going to take CO2. You're going to give it H's from NADPH. You're going to give it the H's. When, when NADPH reduces C CO2, that CO2 becomes C's, H's, and O's. Sugar. You see that? CO2 is reduced to sugar because NADPH reduces CO2 to sugar. And do you think it's free to do that? Do you think energetically energetically, that can happen for free? No, the answer is no. You can't just make sugar for free. It's not negative delta G reaction. So guess what? That's why you need the ATP that you made during the light reactions. The ATP that you made during the light reactions... You're going to use ATP power to reduce the CO2 to sugar, to give these H's from NADPH to CO2 to make sugar. Does that make sense? Because uh, it's not a free thing to make sugar. Okay. And once, once NADPH has reduced CO2 to sugar, NADPH is reconverted back to the oxidized form of the carrier, NADP+. And you can keep this going on, right? You can keep photosynthesis going on. So that's how you made sugars, you see? In step one, 
You use sunlight energy to oxidize water to take its H's away. Give those H's to NADP plus to make NADPH and some ATP. And step two, CO2 was reduced to sugar because those H's from NADPH were given to CO2 to reduce CO2 to sugar. And that was with the help of the energy from ATP. So that's the big, big overview of how photosynthesis works. It's actually a really, really neat process, right? So if you think about it, this is the process that's responsible for life on Earth. And the process that we need if we were to live on any other planet, we'd need to take plants with us, you know? So it's really neat to understand how photosynthesis works. And again, photosynthesis is based on sunlight, right? Uh, it, without energy, without, without solar energy, without light energy, I should say, um, photosynthesis would be impossible without light, okay? And light is a series of wavelengths, okay? Light is a form of electromagnetic energy, also called electromagnetic radiation, but it's a certain range of wavelengths of electromagnetic uh, radiation. Those wavelengths are called visible light, okay? Uh, so here's a, here's a range of electromagnetic radiation all the way from very small wavelengths, you know, because this radiation travels in wavelengths, right? It, it travels in waveform, waveform. And you can have tiny little waves. That means that the peaks and the valleys are tiny in the wave. Or you could have really big waves where the waves are meters big, right? So the tiniest, the tiniest wavelength electromagnetic uh, radiation is, is the gamma rays, right? 10 to the minus 5 nanometers. Nanometer is 10 to the minus 9 meters, right? So this is 10 to the minus 5 nanometers, which is super tiny, right? And then we're talking about in the picometer or femtometer range. These are tiny, tiny, tiny wavelengths. So, um, you know, the wavelengths are, these are for gamma rays. And then 10 to the minus 3 nanometers would be X rays. And 1 nanometer would be UV rays. But th these are types of energy that we can't see. You know, you can't see X-rays or gamma rays or UV rays. You can't see that, the, even though that kind of uh, radiation exists. What we can see is this range right here, this range. We, our, our human eyeballs can only see in this little range right here. And this range of electromagnetic radiation is called visible light. It spans from 380 nanometers, which is purple light, uh, through 450 and 500 nanometers, which is blue light, through 550, which is green light, 600, yellow light, 650, which is about orange light, 700 nanometers, and 750 nanometers, which is red light. So from purple or violet all the way to red, that's the spectrum that our eyeballs can see and this is the range of, mag of radiation that our eyeballs pick up with our rods and cones and pick up and sense as different colors of light. Okay, this is what uh, our eyeballs can see. If the wavelength is bigger than that, like infrared, microwave, or radio wave, our eyeballs can't see it. If the wavelength's shorter than that, like UV, X-ray, or gamma rays, our eyeballs can't see it. Okay. So uh, the shortest wavelength of light that we can see is around 380 nanometers. This is violet light. And what you need to know is shorter wavelength light is higher energy. Longer wavelength light, like red light, is lower energy. Okay, And plants, plants look green. Okay, uh, I'm going to explain why that is in a second. Why are plants green? Well, because plants absorb light besides green. Okay, if something is green, it's because it's absorbing the light colors, except for green. Okay, so do you remember plants have these pigment molecules in them? Mainly, mainly uh, chlorophyll, 
There's chlorophyll A, there's chlorophyll B. We're going to talk about those in a second. But the chlorophyll molecules live in the thylakoid membrane. Remember the membrane of the pancake stacks in the granum? That's where the uh, chlorophyll molecules exist. All right. And why, why is the chlorophyll, um, why is it green? And why, why is the chloroplast green? Well, because of this. Look, sunlight comes down, and the visible light hits, visible light hits the um, thylakoid membrane, right? The membrane of the pancake stacks. And here's what you need to understand: chlorophyll molecules absorb the rainbow of light, of visible light uh, wavelengths, but it doesn't absorb green. What does that mean? Green gets Green passes right through, which is called transmitted light. Green passes right through, and green gets reflected away. Okay, so do you remember this wavelength 550, 525, 550? Um, the chloroplast does not absorb, does not block. Absorb means block, right? Or uh, use, you know, utilize. The, the chlorophyll does not use the green light. The green light goes right through. That's transmitted, and the green light is reflected. So if you see my shirt as blue, my shirt is blue because the sunlight from outside, which is white light, white light is your eyeball seeing all the colors of light at once. That white light hits my shirt. My shirt absorbs all the different colors of light all the wavelengths except for blue light which is remember around uh, 450 nanometers and then that blue light reflects off my shirt and goes to the camera for your eyeballs to see okay and this is what that molecule looks like chlorophyll chlorophyll looks like this it's an organic molecule with a cofactor magnesium is a cofactor all right and um, you don't need to know this exact structure but I just put that here to show you that this is what the molecule looks like chlorophyll A has a methyl group right here whereas chlorophyll B has a carbonyl group a ketone carbonyl group right here okay so that's the only difference between chlorophyll A and chlorophyll B and that each one absorbs a slightly different wavelength of light but it's that's not a big deal um, but they say that chlorophyll A is the main photosynthetic pigment okay uh, but these are the molecules that make plants green okay so the reason chlorophyll molecules are important is because chlorophyll molecules get excited when photons of light hit them especially those photons of light that aren't green you know the the different colors besides green uh, they get absorbed by the chlorophyll molecule. And what happens when light strikes the chlorophyll molecule is that the electrons inside of the chlorophyll molecule, the electron goes to a higher energy state. So the electrons, you know how the electrons exist in various orbitals? Well, those electrons move further away from the atomic nucleus. Those electrons go to a higher energy state. And this is a type of potential energy. This is a type of potential energy. The sunlight moved the electron to a higher energy state. Now the electron wants to go back down to its ground state. And guess what? When the electron does go back down, spontaneously go back down to its ground state, this chlorophyll molecule actually releases that trapped energy. So you could think of it as like a capacitor. Photon of light hits a chlorophyll molecule. Its electrons get boosted to a higher ex, uh, energy state called the excited state when the electrons then collapse back down to the ground state spontaneously the chlorophyll can then release that trapped energy from the sun so it's almost like the sun charges these molecules up those molecules go back down to uncharged when they do they release their own energy you know that they transmit that energy on right so that's kind of how the chlorophyll molecule works so I'm gonna take another quick little break I'm gonna come back and explain exactly how this molecule functions in the light reactions of photosynthesis and and where is this 
chlorophyll molecule? Where where does it exist? You know, and and it has everything to do with these photo systems, which I'll explain when we return. All right, break time. Welcome back. So I was about to tell you about the photosystems and how they participate in photosynthesis. But before I do, uh, because the, first of all, the photosystems look like this and they're involved in photosynthesis. But let me let me let me show you an overview real quick before I before I tell you what a photosystem is. Let me show you this image here. This is uh, Basically, do you guys remember the first part of photosynthesis was called the light reactions? Okay, uh, this is a summary of the light reactions of photosynthesis, this right here. So, look what we have here. First of all, you might see a membrane. See this membrane here? See this membrane here? This membrane is curved like this for a reason. This membrane is the thylakoid membrane. Remember, it's the curved uh, pancake membrane. It's the membrane of the of an individual pancake in the grana uh, pancake stacks, right? So you've got the thylakoid membrane inside of the chloroplast, right? And in this membrane, remember I said the chlorophyll molecules exist in this membrane. You see these little tiny green dots? These little tiny green dots are the chlorophyll molecules, right? So the green dots are in this structure. This is called photosystem 2. See, that's where the green dots are. That's where the chlorophyll is. And it's in this other structure called photosystem 1 as well. So you've got photosystem 2 with chlorophyll molecules. You've got photosystem 1 with chlorophyll molecules. So I'm going to explain to you in just a moment what photosystems do, how photosystems work. Okay, so but just know that you've got photosystem two in the thylakoid membrane, and it responds to light. It then uh, passes off electrons to. Look at this thing. It's got PQ plastoquinone. It's got cytochrome complex and PC. You know what this is right here, these three things? PQ, cytochrome complex, and PC, these blue ones. These, this is an electron transport chain. This right here is an electron transport chain. PQ, cytochrome complex, and PC is an electron transport chain. Do you know what, they, what an electron transport chain does? Just like we learned in cellular respiration, um, when electrons cross an electron transport chain like this, you see where the electrons are coming from photosystem 2, the electrons are going to photosystem 1. When electrons cross an electron transport chain much like this right here, protons, protons are pumped. Protons are pumped into the thylakoid space. Why? Because the electrons are moving through the electron transport chain spontaneously that provides the energy that's the exergonic reaction that drives the endergonic reaction here of protons getting pumped actively into the thylakoid space the thylakoid space is the space or fluid inside of the pancake stacks okay so now what would you have here you would have a high concentration of protons here in the thylakoid space. What do those protons want to do? That's right. If you guess they want to diffuse back to the stroma, the fluid outside of the pancakes, which has low proton concentration or relative proton concentration, you'd be right. But can protons float through directly through the membrane like this? Can protons go out of the membrane directly? No, because protons are charged, right? Protons are charged. H plus is charged. Protons can't cross the membrane directly. So what did the protons do? They need a transporter, a carrier protein. And that transporter, you guessed it, 
this is the transporter that's going to let those protons chemiosmos diffuse back out and that that is called ATP synthase the top part will spin the top part will spin as the protons force their way out and the bottom part will produce ATP by joining ADP and PI inorganic phosphate together to form ATP this is the ATP that's made during the light reactions of photosynthesis. This is called photophosphorylation. That's how you make ATP during, during this process of photosynthesis. And that ATP is going to be used for step two, the Calvin cycle. Okay, that's great. So again, electrons, uh, so the photosystem two responded to light. That's what allowed electrons to go through the electron transport chain. That's what allowed protons to be pumped actively into the thylakoid space. Those protons then diffused back out into the stroma through chemiosmosis, uh, exerting a proton motive force, which spun ATP synthase, allowing ATP to form. That ATP is going to be used by the Calvin cycle. But where did those electrons end up? The electrons ended up on photosystem 1, and then the electrons go to this protein called NADP plus reductase. And the protons are given to NADP+, the carrier, to reduce it to NADPH. So the electrons make their way to NADPH. And those, that NADPH moves off to the Calvin cycle to donate those H's to make sugars. And where did these electrons come from? If we trace it all the way back, the electrons come from water. Uh, it looks like photosystem 2 steals the electrons from water. And those electrons go on this journey to NADP plus to make NADPH and those electrons end up on NADPH and off to the Calvin cycle and, and once you've stolen those electrons or those H's from the water all you're left with from your water is oxygen so this is an overview of what's called the linear reaction or linear uh, light fo uh, light system okay uh, I should say linear electron flow of uh, of uh, photosynthesis, linear electron flow. Why do they call it linear electron flow? The electrons start on water. The electrons then make their way with the, with the help of light. The electrons then make their way in a linear fashion to NADP plus to make NADPH. And off you go to the Calvin cycle. So that's an overview of how the light reactions work to photosynthesis. But how exactly are these photosystems working? You see this? It looks kind of like an apple, this purple apple. Um, this one's called photosystem 2. This one's called photosystem 1. How in the world are these photosystems working? So let's talk about that. Okay, let's go back to that. Remember, the photosystems look like these apples, right? This is a photosystem. This membrane is the thylakoid membrane, right? The membrane of the pancakes. And this 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 uh, complex is called the uh, photosystem. It's a photosystem, okay? And remember the green dots in the photosystem? The green dots are the chlorophyll molecules. And not only chlorophyll, but other pigment molecules as well. We haven't talked about them, but... You have chlorophyll A, you could have chlorophyll B, you could have xanthophyll or carotenoids. There are all different kinds of pigment molecules. What does a pigment molecule mean? Again, remember it's a molecule that gets excited by sunlight. Sunlight moves the electrons in the pigment to a higher energy state, uh, which is a type of potential energy. When those, when those electrons go back to their ground state, they release that potential energy, and that energy can be bounced around that energy can be passed off to other pigment molecules so let's let's talk about it let's talk about how that works notice there are two parts to the photosystem the purple part right with the green dots uh, that part's called the light harvesting complex that's where the story starts and then there's this blue part in the middle the blue part in the middle is called the reaction center complex that's that's the second part of the story. So let's start with the first part of the story because the photosystem has two main parts, the light harvesting complex, the purple and green part, 
and the reaction center complex, the blue part with the two green dots in the middle. So let's talk about this. Let's, let's start with the light harvesting complex. Okay, how does that work? The light harvesting complex, uh, this is a, a protein right here. This is protein. And inside of the protein is uh, these green dots, which are chlorophyll or different pigment molecules. Okay, you've got the pigment molecules. And sunlight traveling millions and millions of miles from the sun, sunlight strikes a pigment molecule, exciting the pigment molecule, exciting the pigment molecule. Remember what sunlight does when it, when it strikes the pigment? That pigment's electrons go to a higher energy state. And when the pigment goes back down to ground energy state, this pigment itself passes on a, a energy. It's not passing on electrons. I want to make that very clear right now, okay? When sunlight strikes this pigment, this pigment becomes excited, but it doesn't pass an electron to the next pigment. You know what it passes on to the next pigment? This pigment passes on energy, energy to the next pigment, not electrons, energy. And when this pigment passes on energy to this pigment, this pigment gets excited. Its electrons go to a higher energy state. Does that make sense? So the light, the photon of light, all it had to do was excite this pigment. Then on its own, this pigment excited this pigment, which then in turn excites its neighbor, which then in turn excites its neighbor, which then excites its neighbor. You see, that's why it's called the light harvesting complex, because here's light, and the power of light gets harvested. It gets passed on until it reaches the center called the reaction center so the light gets the light energy energy from the light gets passed on and on and on and on and on until it gets passed to these two green dots there's always two green dots in the center those are uh, called the special pair there's always two the special pair of chlorophyll a it's chlorophyll a there's a chlorophyll A, there's a chlorophyll A. Special pair of chlorophyll A molecules inside of the photosystem. Not only in the photosystem, it's in the blue part called the reaction center. And that's where the energy goes. That's where the energy goes from the green from the purple parts. Okay? The energy reaches the special chlorophyll pair. So what does the special chlorophyll pair do at this point? And why is it so special? Here's what it does. Okay, you ready for this? When the special chlorophyll pair gets excited, it not only gets excited, it passes on electrons. Did you see that? Did the other chlorophyll mo molecules, did the other pigment molecules pass off electrons? No, remember these ones got excited and passed on energy. But once you reach the special pair, the special pair, when they get excited, they don't just pass off energy, they actually pass off their electrons. They say, here, take my electrons. So they actually um, can become oxidized, right? So this becomes oxidized. It, it releases its electrons. So it loses its electrons. It becomes oxidized. And it reduces, it gives electrons to it, reduces this box. This box represents the, the uh, primary electron acceptor. Okay, this is the box that's going to accept those electrons. It's the primary electron acceptor. And then what happens to those electrons from this point? Here's what you need to know. Once the primary electron acceptor, this box, gets those electrons from the special pair, it can then pass off those electrons. The electrons can then leave the photosystem altogether. They actually leave the photosystem and go on a journey somewhere. Okay, so that's how a photosystem works. Again, photons of light strike pigment molecules in the light harvesting complex. Pigment becomes excited, which then in turn excites its neighbor. That neighbor is now excited, and it will excite its neighbor, which excites its neighbor, which excites its neighbor, which excites its neighbor, who happens to be a special chlorophyll pair member. And that special chlorophyll pair, once excited, can become oxidized, passing off electrons to the reaction center complex, which becomes reduced. And that complex then passes off the electrons 
you know, and the electrons can actually leave the entire apple. They leave the whole photosystem. So knowing that, let's bounce back to this process. Do you remember? This is the full overview. This is the full overview of the light reactions of photosynthesis. So let's take a closer look. Okay. Look, remember I said the the story begins at photosystem 2 and then later on you have photosystem 1. I just want to tell you something before I start explaining this. You see the special chlorophyll pair on photosystem 2 and the special chlorophyll pair on photosystem 1. Well, what I need you to know is that they have special names. Okay, look. They have special names. Let's find those names. I just want to show you. Look, on photosystem 2, the special pair is called P680. On photosystem 1, the special pair of chlorophyll A is called P700. So let me show you. Here, you see those two uh, chlorophyll molecules, chlorophyll A's? Those two are called P680. You see these two over here? Those two are called P700. Okay. And the reason for that is that's like the optimal wavelength of absorbance by those pairs. You don't need to know that, but that's where that name came from. So anyway, let's break it down. Are you ready? This is how the light reactions of photosynthesis work. The story begins at photosystem 2. I know that's weird. Photosystem 2 comes first, and then photosystem 1 comes later. You might be wondering why. Let me address that real quick before we start. Photosystem 1 was discovered first, and then Photosystem 2 was discovered later, uh, hence the weird uh, nomenclature, 1 and 2. Um, it, even though Photosystem occurs first in the process, it's called Photosystem 2 because it was discovered second. So you don't need to know that, but uh, just in case you're curious or confused. So le again, let's start this process. So what is this membrane? This is the thylakoid membrane, the membrane of the pancake stacks. What is this apple structure? This is uh, the photosystem 2 with the purple part called the light harvesting complex and the blue part called the reaction center. The reaction center has a special pair called P680. Remember that? So here we go. So light from the sun light strikes this green dot this pigment molecule uh, that pigment could be chlorophyll a that pigment could be chlorophyll b that pigment could be xanthophyll or carotenoids it doesn't matter it's a pigment in the light harvesting complex that pigment becomes excited remember that this pigment becomes excited which then can excite its neighbor which excites its neighbor which excites its neighbor which excites its neighbor which excites its neighbor which is P680, excites P680. And what does P680 do that's different? It not only excites its neighbor, it, it, instead of exciting its neighbor, it passes electrons. You see the yellow arrows here? The yellow arrows represent electrons actually getting passed. So the P680 passes electrons. It becomes oxidized to P680+. Uh, the electrons hop to the box, the primary electron acceptor. And then look, the electrons leave photosystem 2. They go on a journey, you see? Those electrons go on this long journey. So let's go step by step. The electrons hop to the box, the primary electron acceptor. The electrons then leave the photosystem, and they go through this guy called PQ. They go through this guy, this transmembrane protein complex called cytochrome complex. And then they travel through this guy called PC, and then they end up here stuck here they, they they wait here they're stuck here on p700 which is this central chlorophyll pair on photosystem one that's where they kind of get temporarily stuck so let's talk about this again light strikes a pigment that pigment excites its neighbor excites its neighbor excites its neighbor the excitement reaches the central chlorophyll pair which then becomes oxidized to p680 plus from p680 to p680 plus the electrons go to this box called the primary electron acceptor. The electrons can then leave the photosystem too, leave, go through PQ, cytochrome complex, and PC, and now they're stuck on P700 in photosystem 1. 
So what happened? What happened as the electrons crossed this way? What happened as the electrons crossed PQ cytochrome complex and PC? Let's talk about that again. PQ cytochrome complex and PC. This constitutes what's called a electron transport chain or ETC. What does that mean? That means that electrons spontaneously move through the electron transport chain spontaneously. So for free, that releases energy, right? Spontaneous things release energy. So the electrons traveling through PQ, cytochrome complex, and PC releases energy that you could use to do work. What work does it want to do? Well, cytochrome complex in particular wants to do something with that energy. It will use that energy to move protons from the fluid out here called the stroma. Uh, stroma. It will move protons in to the space down here called the thylakoid space. You see? So now protons have been actively transported, actively transported against the concentration gradient. Now you have a really high concentration of protons in the thylakoid space. Why do we care about that? Well, guess what? Those protons want to go back out into the stroma, right? If protons have been actively pumped into the thylakoid space, you know what that means? That means there's going to be a lot of protons in this space. And those protons are going to want to diffuse right back out where there's lower, relatively lower proton concentration. And again, can protons cross directly through the membrane back out? No, they need an avenue, and that avenue is provided by this protein complex, which should look familiar. This protein complex is called ATP synthase, just like the ATP synthase during cell respiration. Okay, what happens? Protons, protons diffuse out, diffuse through the ATP synthase, and when they do that, ATP synthase spins. And that allows this part of ATP synthase to join ADP, adenosine diphosphate, with P, or PI, called inorganic phosphate. When you take diphosphate and phosphate, inorganic phosphate, you make ATP, adenosine triphosphate. And that is how you make ATP. And remember, this process is called photophosphorylation. And that ATP can then go to the Calvin cycle to help with making sugars, okay? So that was why the electrons moving through PQ cytochrome complex and PC was important because that electron flow provided the energy to actively pump protons into the thylakoid space. And those protons chemiosmosing back out into the stroma through proton motive force was, gave the ATP synthase the power it needed to spin and produce ATP through photophosphorylation, okay? And that ATP is a product of the light reactions of photosynthesis, and that ATP is required for the Calvin cycle, okay? So where do we leave off? The, the electrons are now stuck on photosystem one. The electrons are now stuck on photosystem one at this central pair called P700. Light now strikes, look, light strikes this pigment molecule in the purple part. Remember the light harvesting complex of photosystem one? Well, we're doing this again. Light strikes this pigment, which becomes excited, which excites this pigment, which excites its neighbor, which excites its neighbor, which excites its neighbor, which excites its neighbor, and then the excitement reaches the P700 where these electrons are now waiting. They're the electrons that had that had been waiting here, they're waiting here. The excitement from the sunlight reaches there. Now that central pair can become oxidized. That central pair passes off those electrons. The electrons can now leave ship, leave the photosystem one, and go on a journey through FD to this enzyme. This is an enzyme called NADP plus reductase. This enzyme is not NADP plus. This enzyme is NADP plus reductase. It's the enzyme, ACE, it's the enzyme that reduces NADP plus. Okay, so those electrons come to NADP plus reductase. Those electrons are given to NADP plus to reduce NADP plus to NADPH. So what does this enzyme do? It basically hands those incoming electrons to NADP plus, reducing it to NADPH. That's how the NADPH is made 
during the light reactions of photosynthesis, which go to the Calvin cycle. And with the help of ATP and NADPH from these steps, go to the Calvin cycle to make sugars, okay? Now, 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 you might, you might, let's start over real quick. Look at this. Oh, I didn't explain this part, right? Do you remember what happened at the beginning? Light hit this pigment, which excited that pigment, which excited that pigment. And then when P680 got excited, it got oxidized to P680 plus, and those protons, uh, I'm sorry, um, the electrons went on a journey. Well, guess what? Now the P680 is called P680 plus. You know why? Because it's oxidized. It, the electrons already went on this journey, and, and so the, it lost its electrons, right? So it needs more electrons. The pair needs more electrons. Where is it going to get more electrons? Here's how. Look, water is going to come along. And water is going to reload P680 with electrons. Water will reduce P680 plus back to P680 so that this whole thing that I just explained can happen again. To, to reload it, to reload it with electrons, right? Because it lost its electrons, you see? So we have to give it more electrons. How do we give it more electrons? Water will donate its electrons to the P680 plus. So how does that work? Um, P680 plus, here's what you need to understand. P680 plus is a very oxidative force. Uh, let me bust out my, my little board here. Give it a quick little erase. Okay. Uh, do I have a thick marker? Oh, I have a thin one. I think you could read this. Okay, look, P680 plus, yeah, you can see that, right? P680 plus is very, very oxidative. You know what oxidative means? It has a high PO ratio. Um, it has a high, uh, sorry, EO ratio, EO ratio. It has a, um, uh, a, a very, it's very oxidative. It's, it's high electronegativity very high electronegativity. So it's so greedy for electrons. P680 plus, you know, when, when P680 has lost its electrons, it's so greedy for electrons, its EO prime value is high. Okay? Its EO is high, which means it is super oxidative. It can take electrons from water, okay? It can take electrons from water. Uh, I'll say steals electrons from water, H2O. Okay, steals electrons from water. That's how greedy it is for water, and uh, uh, for electrons, I should say. So what is it? what happens when it picks up those electrons? What does P680 become? Uh, P680 plus becomes P680 again, okay? Now its EO is lower. Okay, its EO is lower. Its its reduct reduction potential is lower. Its greediness for electrons is lower. Um, but does that mean it passes off those electrons? Take a look. Take a look here. So P680 plus is so greedy for electrons it could steal electrons from water. Those electrons. Those electrons make P680 plus back to P680. It reduces it back to P680. But those electrons still can't leave. You know when those electrons can leave and go on that journey again? Only when sunlight. Sunlight has to help. Sunlight hits this pigment, which excites that pigment, which excites this pigment, which excites that pigment, which excites that pigment, which excites, that pigment, which excites P680. Look, P680 had a lower reduction potential. Okay, P680 had a lower reduction potential, but P680 plus energy from the sun, wow, that's a very low EO, very low, very low reduction potential, very negative value for reduction potential, and when you have a negative the O value, you're easily oxidized, the, the electrons can go on a journey. So do you see, 
P680 is a very special little molecule. Why? Because it, it's like Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. When it's missing its electron, when the electron leaves, it becomes P680 plus, which is like one of the strongest oxidizing agents in the universe. Okay, it, it's greedy, greedy, greedy for electrons. But then once it got those electrons, once it becomes P680, and especially once it becomes P680 and receives excitement energy, excitement from the sunlight, now it switches from a very positive EO value, a very positive reduction potential, very positive uh, electronegativity to very negative reduction potential, very negative EO value, very, very negative uh, electronegativity. Uh, so it has a very negative EO value. Now the electrons easily leave, right? The electrons easily hop to the primary electron acceptor and go on a journey, right? Same thing here. The electrons reach P700. Uh, that Then they, they're stuck there. They're stuck there until sunlight energy makes its way to P700. P700 switches to a very negative EO value, letting go of those electrons. Those electrons go on a journey. So what they say is P680 is kind of like a reduction potential switch because you're going from a very positive EO value to a very negative EO value and back and forth and back and forth. It's like a switch. Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde. Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde. Very positive EO value, very negative EO value. That's kind of how this whole process works. And again, this is called linear electron flow of photosynthesis, of the light reactions of photosynthesis, because the electrons start on water. Water is the primary electron donor, and the electrons end up on NADP plus to make NADPH. Okay, and that, that's where the electrons ended up at the end of uh, light reactions. Now those electrons are off to the Calvin cycle to make sugar. Okay. So again, what are the reactants of the light of the uh, of linear linear electron flow of photosynthesis? The reactants are sunlight and water, and the products are what? The products are NADPH, ATP through photophosphorylation, and the waste product is oxygen. This is why plants breathe out oxygen and provide the Earth with oxygen and that is the source of oxygen on the planet that you and I enjoy okay um, there are a lot of slides here in a row uh, see linear electron flow this is linear electron flow you can see in linear electron flow you've got step one with p680 and photosystem two step two step three step four step five Okay, these are the steps we talked about uh, in detail just now. So this, these slides will help you break down the, those concepts again. Okay, this is the uh, this conceptually what's happening with those energy states of the electrons as well. So let me take a quick break. When we come back, I'll, I'll explain cyclic electron flow. I'll also explain a little bit about the Calvin cycle, which is how we're actually going to make sugar. And then we'll wrap up this chapter, all right? We're almost through it. I hope you're with me so far. All right, I'm going to grab another tea or something, and you do the same. Break time. Hey, everyone. Welcome back. All right, so I told you that I would let you know what cyclic electron flow means during uh, photosynthesis. Let me explain cyclic electron flow. I'll use this image to explain it. Remember what linear electron flow was? The electrons started out on water and then they made their journey through all the way to NADP plus and joined, the electrons joined up with NADP plus to make an ADPH, right? That's linear electron flow. So what's cyclic electron flow? It's, it's a process that plants can uh, employ to maximize the use of these electrons uh, make as much ATP as possible. So let me show you how it works. Uh, once the electrons make their way here to P700, what should they do, right? Uh, normally, 
the sunlight energy excites these pigments, which then excite P700, and those electrons get passed on from P700, and the electrons go this way, right? Normally, the electrons go to NADP plus reductase, right? Uh, now, during cyclic electron flow, which is kind of, you can think of it as a short circuiting of this process of photosynthesis, uh, the electrons are actually passed the other way. You see, the electrons are passed through cytochrome complex again, back to PC, and back to photosystem 1. So imagine sunlight hits this pigment in the, uh, in the light harvesting complex of photosystem 1, that pigment becomes excited, which excites its neighbor, 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 which excites, its neighbor, which excites P700, making it a very negative EO, negative reduction potential, ne uh, low, low, low electronegativity. Those electrons leave, but instead of leaving to the right, they leave to the left. They go through the electron transport chain to PC and right back to P700. To have that happen again, sunlight excites, it goes back through, uh, through cytochrome complex, back to PC, back to P700, sunlight hit energy excites again, it goes back, you see, this is a cycle, you see, this is no longer linear, starting at water and ending up on NADPH, this is a closed loop, it's a circle, the electrons go from P700 back through cytochrome complex, back through PC, back to P700. With the help of sunlight energy, they leave again back through cytochrome complex, back through PC, back to P700, and again, and again, and again. So as long as you have sunlight, you can employ cyclic electron flow. But well, what's the point of that? Why would you want to keep doing this over? Why would a plant want to keep doing this over and over and over instead of getting getting through with it, getting to the point, which is to make NADPH? Why? Why do this cycle over and over? Well, what are you producing with this cycle? Are you producing NADPH? No. Are you producing extra oxygen? No. But what are you producing? You're going through this electron transport chain over and over and over. You know what that does? That powers the cytochrome complex, powers this pump to pump protons, right? Because when the electrons flow, they flow spontaneously. That provides energy, energy to do something active, which is pump protons. So the proton concentration becomes high here. Those protons then want to go back out. They diffuse back out through chemiosmosis, exerting a proton motive force, spinning ATP synthase, which produces ATP in the stroma. Right? That so so cyclic electron flow. This guy, you see. The, during cy cyclic, I'm sorry, during cyclic electron flow, P700 uh, provides electrons, right? Because uh, sunlight, sunlight hits a pigment, which excites its neighbor, which excites a neighbor, which excites a neighbor, which excites P700. P700 releases electrons, which leaves P, uh, photosystem one, goes through cytochrome complex, back to PC, back to P700 over and over and over again and remember the only product of cyclic electron flow is atp not oxygen not nadph during cyclic electron flow uh it's kind of a short circuiting of this system you're only producing atp okay so that's the point of cyclic electron flow now one one more thing that you should really understand um that you should really take note of and understand for exam reasons, is the difference between what's going on in the mitochondria during cellular respiration versus what's going on in the chloroplast during photosynthesis, okay? What's happening in each? Uh, keep in mind, both of them have an area with high proton concentration, an area that uh, a membrane, both of them have a special membrane that has an electron transport chain and ATP synthase, and both of them have an area where ATP is actually made. So you should know that. For example, where's the proton concentration high in the mitochondria? It's high in the intermembrane space. Where's the proton concentration high in the chloroplast? It's high in the thylakoid space. See, this is kind of a cheat sheet. See, the proton concentration in the mitochondria is high in the intermembrane space. 
the proton concentration is high in the thylakoid space in the chloroplast. What about in the mitochondria? Where is the ATP synthase found in the mitochondria and the ETC? They're found in the inner membrane, not the outer membrane, the inner membrane, right? What about the chloroplast? Where is the ETC and ATP synthase found? Remember, it's in the thylakoid membrane. It's in the pancake stack membrane right there, okay? And then in both of them, where is the ATP actually made? Where is the ATP actually made? In the mitochondria, it's made in the fluid in here. This is called the matrix, right? It's made here. In the chloroplast, it's made in the uh, stroma over here. Okay, that's where the ATP is made. So just know that, remember, and the ATP made in the mitochondria is made by oxidative phosphorylation, and the ATP made in the chloroplast is made by photo phosphorylation, okay? So just know that, be able to juxtapose the two, compare and contrast, okay? Because it's very similar. They both involve proton concentration, ATP synthesis, ATP synthase, electron transport chain. They're very, very similar processes. They're just converse reactions, right? So what else? The last thing we need to talk about is this, remember, let me jump to the beginning real quick. Okay. We just talked about linear electron flow, how the products are oxygen, ATP, and NADPH. It required light and water. Water was the uh, primary electron donor, the first electron donor. And what did we, again, what did we produce ATP and NADPH, which needs to feed into part two, the Calvin cycle. Where does the Calvin cycle happen? Where does part two of photosynthesis happen? It happens in the fluid. Look, it's the fluid outside of the pancake stacks. This is the stroma. Photosynthesis Calvin cycle happens in the stroma. Okay? And look, what do we require? We require CO2 for Calvin cycle as a reactant. We also require ATP from the light reactions, NADPH from the light reactions. Remember, that's the source of our H's, and sugar. So again, what are we about to do? Remember, we're trying to make sugar, which is C's, H's, and O's. The C's and the O's come from CO2. The H's come from NADPH. There's your H right there. So we have to give these H's to CO2, which is going to convert our NADPH and oxidize it back to NADP+. And that's not a free thing to do. That's actually difficult to do. So ATP is going to allow us to do that until we've got sugars made. So let's talk about the Calvin cycle, which happens in the stroma. Let's talk about that. Okay, so Calvin cycle. What you need to understand about the Calvin cycle is that there are three main phases to the Calvin cycle. You need to understand the first phase is called carbon fixation. And the enzyme responsible for carbon fixation is Rubisco. Um, then phase two is called reduction. And phase three is regeneration of the CO2 acceptor ribulose bisphosphate, or RUBP. Let me break that down for you. This is what the Calvin cycle looks like. Again, the Calvin cycle occurs in the stroma of the chloroplast, and it's a cycle. I'll explain why it's a cycle in a minute. See what feeds into the cycle? CO2, 3CO2. CO2, they enter one at a time. Each CO2 enters one at a time, so you're seeing what happens to one CO2. All right. Um, actually, you're seeing what happens to all three, but just know that they feed in one at a time. Now, before you start panicking, you don't need to know every single step of the Calvin cycle and what happens during every little step. So don't panic. Instead, focus on what I'm about to say. These are the important things to understand. CO2 comes into the cycle. Rubisco, Rubisco is the enzyme that captures the CO2 and does a process called carbon fixation. Phase one is called carbon fixation. The enzyme that catalyzes that reaction, the enzyme that makes that happen is called Rubisco. And what does carbon fixation mean? Here's what it means, okay? Carbon fixation means taking carbon from a gas form like CO2, taking CO2 from gas form and making it into solid form. How do you do that? How do you make uh, carbon a get from a gas to a solid? Here's how. Here's what this enzyme is doing. Here's what Rubisco is doing. Are you ready? You see this molecule right here that I'm highlighting or uh, circling? This 
molecule is an organic molecule. It's a carbon-containing solid called RUBP, or ribulose bisphosphate. You see, it's got one, two, three, four, five carbons in it. Two phosphate groups, that's why it's called bisphosphate, two phosphate groups. Anyway, this organic molecule is a solid, right? It's not a gas, it's a solid. It's called RUBP, ribulose bisphosphate, also known as uh, the CO2 acceptor. RUBP is the CO2 acceptor. So what is it going to do? It's going to accept CO2. What does that mean? Rubisco, the enzyme, takes CO2 and sticks it onto RUBP. You see this? You see this? One, two, three, four, five, six carbons now on RUBP. So you take this, you stick a carbon dioxide on to the second carbon, okay? And then this is very unstable molecule, which breaks down into these phosphoglycerate molecules, three carbon molecules. All right, again, you don't need to know these little baby steps, but I'm just telling you what's happening. You're taking a solid called RUBP. It's the CO2 acceptor. Rubisco, the enzyme, attaches CO2 to the acceptor, and now CO2 is fixed. This is what carbon fixation means, taking CO2 carbon as from a gas state to a solid state. This, this molecule breaks down into phosphoglycerate. And then guess what? What are we going to do at this point? What have we captured? Have we made sugar yet? No. All we've done is got C's and O's for our sugar. You know, remember what sugar is? C's, H's, and O's? We've now captured C's and O's to make sugar. And look, with the help of ATP, with the help of ATP, we are going to use our NADPH. And we're going to hand those H's. We're going to hand those H's to the C's and O's, to the uh, carbon dioxide that we captured, basically. And that process is called reduction. Do you remember what reduction means? Gaining of electrons. If we take our C's and our O's, and we reduce it, that means we're giving it those electrons. We're giving it those H's from NATPH. And that's not free. It's not easy to do. So ATP is required from the light reactions. You see that? So now we have what? We've given the H's from NADPH. With the help of ATP, we've given those H's to the CO2 we captured. So now we have sugars. We've made sugars. We've made sugars, which are ultimately going to become the six carbon sugar, glucose, and other organic compounds. Yay! That we did it. We got C's, H's, and O's. We got our C's and our O's from the air, from CO2, through carbon fixation. We then handed it a bunch of H's from NADPH with the help of ATP. Now we have C's, H's, and O's. Boom! We got sugars and other organic molecules. Awesome, right? So that's phase one, taking CO2 out of the air. Phase two, giving it H's or electrons to make sugar. Now we've got our sugar, but we still have to close this loop. We still have to finish this cycle. So what's the last thing we have to do? Part three, phase three, is called regeneration of the CO2 acceptor, RUBP. Do you see this molecule right here? Do you see this molecule right here? This is called RUBP, ribulose bisphosphate. We just talked about it. It's the molecule that's going to accept this incoming CO2. It's going to accept that CO2 through carbon fixation. You have to make some more of this so that you can keep the cycle going. At the end of the cycle, you have to regenerate this guy, RUBP, ribulose bisphosphate. So the Rubisco enzyme can hand it another CO2, and you can do this process over again. So again, um, this process co uh, consists of three phases, carbon fixation, which is catalyzed by the enzyme Rubisco, takes CO2 out of thin air, out of gas state, and actually attaches it to this ribulose bisphosphate, this carbon dioxide acceptor, and then with the help of ATP and NADPH, that carbon dioxide is then reduced to sugar, and of course we have to regenerate our RUBP, ribulose bisphosphate, to keep the cycle going. Okay, and that's all there is to it, really. Uh, now you see why we required ATP and NADPH from the earlier steps because we're going to use them to reduce the CO2 in the latter steps. And um, remember, this ATP was made by uh, photophosphorylation during the light reactions of photosynthesis. 
Um, do you guys remember where uh, where did this H come from? Where did these electrons come from on the NADPH originally? Where did they where did they come from? From water. Remember, we took the H's from water. The oxygen released as the the water's oxygen released as O2. So the electrons came from water originally. The electrons went to NADP plus to make NADPH, and here those electrons are going to that CO2 to make sugar. So think about it. The electrons in photosynthesis, the electrons started on water, they went to NADPH, and then they went to CO2 to make C's, H's, and O's to make sugars. So CO2, CO2 is reduced. It gains electrons. CO2 is reduced to sugar water we took its electrons away water was oxidized to oxygen and so it's a beautiful process it's the converse reaction to cellular respiration and it's the entire reason you and i are alive and that we have oxygen to breathe we have calories to eat and drink and that we can live in a planet that's not overrun by co2 so thank you plants Thank you, uh, photosynthesizers, and thank you guys for watching and learning about the importance of photosynthesis. So with that, I'm going to wrap up this, this uh, chapter and this concept. I hope you learned something. All right, feel free to ask questions, and I'll catch you guys next time.